Good morning. Hope you had a fantastic 4th of July. Uh, this morning we're going to celebrate communion together as a church family. Uh, some of you have already gotten the prepackaged communion cup and wafer that, uh, that we made available. If you didn't get that, you can still participate in communion. Uh, maybe you've got some juice at home or you've got some crackers. The most important thing about communion is that we do it according to God's word. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. That's the most important thing. If you celebrate communion with us this morning, that you, you do it remembering Jesus and his love and his sacrifice for you. It's challenging to live a sacrificial life. A young married couple discovered that. They were going through a power struggle in their marriage. Neither one wanted to give in to the other. Each one wanted to do their own thing. One day the husband decided he was going to put an end to it all. He marched in and he marched up to his wife. And he said, tonight you're going to make my dinner. He said, I'm the master of the house. My word is law. Tonight, you're going to march into that kitchen and you're going to make my favorite dish for supper. And then after that, you're going to prepare my favorite dessert and serve it to me. And then after that, I'm going to sit on the couch and watch TV. And you're going to bring me my slippers and you're going to bring me the TV remote. And while I'm watching TV, you're going to draw a bath for me. And after I finish my bath, who do you think is going to dress me and comb my hair? His wife looked at him and she said, the funeral director. He thought he was winning, but he was actually losing. We find the same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus and his 11 disciples are, are there. Jesus is arrested. His 11 disciples go free. Who, who looks like they won? Judas betrays Jesus. And he gets the 30 silver coins that he bargained for. Who looks like they won? The religious leaders. They'd been after Jesus for a while now. And finally they had him. Who looks like they won? Yet the one who looked like he lost was really the one who won. Vince Lombardi, championship football coach, said, Winning isn't a sometime thing. It's an all-the-time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is an all-the-time thing. Winning is an everyday thing. As Christians, what can we do to win every day? What can we do to live a victorious Christian life? Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we, we learn six things that can help you live every day as a victorious Christian. First of all, you win when you surrender. Seems counterintuitive to us. We think when you surrender, you lose. But when you surrender to the will of God, you win. That's what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 39 says, Jesus fell on his face and prayed, prayed, saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In the flesh, Jesus wanted the cup to pass from him. You remember what the cup represented? The cup represented the wrath of God that was to be poured out on all of the sin of all of mankind. See, if Jesus drank that cup, he would take all of the sin of all of mankind on himself and the punishment for it. The wages of sin is death, separation from God. And Jesus Christ experienced the punishment for every sin ever committed on the cross. And, and you see why in the flesh Jesus didn't want that. But Jesus won when he surrendered to the will of the Father. And we win by doing the same thing. Romans chapter 12 says, Present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Every day, 
Surrender your body to God to do what he wants you to do. Every day, surrender your mind to God to think the way he wants you to think. Every day, surrender your will to God and follow him. You see, we're, we're, really, we're kind of like this pen. This pen has a purpose. And placed in the right hands, this pen can be very special. If I give this pen to Frank Devone and I take my hands off it, Frank can do some fantastic things. Frank can do a tremendous work of art with this pen. If I give this pen to Bonnie Pearson, uh, Bonnie Pearson could use it and she could write a, a tremendous God-honoring play like First Christmas in London. Or if I place this pen in Erica's hands or Jose's hands or Allison's hands or Luke's hands, they could use it and they could write a God-honoring uh, hymn or, or, or worship chorus with it. But what if I don't let go? What if I give it to the person but I hang on to it still? It's not going to be nearly as effective, isn't it? What if I give it to one person and another person and another person? Well, well then I, I don't totally give it, do I? And because I don't totally surrender it, it's really not going to, going to accomplish what it can. And we're the same way with our lives. We give ourselves to God, but very often we only give ourselves to God partially. We give ourselves to God and to money and to power and to popularity and to the opinions of others when we need to give ourselves totally to God. The key to winning is to surrender yourself totally to Christ. Thomas Akempis said, carry the cross patiently and with perfect submission, and in the end, it will carry you. Secondly, you win when you're gracious to those who fail you. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and they were, they were probably his closest friends on earth at the time. They'd spent three years together. His disciples had left everything to follow him. They loved him. And Jesus loved them. He poured his life into them. But then here in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the hour of his distress, Jesus asked them, just come with me and watch and pray. And they all fall asleep. Earlier, Peter had said, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And so said all the disciples. They all said, we will die with you. And then they all fall asleep in Jesus' hour of distress. You know, Jesus could have said to them, die with me. You can't even stay awake for me. Yet his response was much more gracious than that to those that disappointed him. Jesus said, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. What a gracious response. I know you want to do this. I know you're trying to do this. But if you rely on your own strength, you'll fail. Has someone failed you? A friend? A loved one? A coworker? Take your cue from Jesus and treat them kindly. The third way we win is you win when you pray. What's the downside of prayer? There is no downside of prayer. If you get what you prayed for, that's great. If you didn't get what you prayed for, well, that's even better. Because when you pray, you discover God's will and you find God's will. And you find in a lot of cases that, that what God wants is different than what you want because God has something better in store for you. You always win when you pray because when you pray, you discover God's will. And when you pray, you, you get to know God better. Jesus won because he prayed and his disciples were defeated because while they should have been praying, when they should have been praying, they were sleeping. Number four, you win when you face your challenges. Verse 45, Jesus said, The hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, 
let us be going. When Jesus said, rise, let us be going, he wasn't saying, let's get out of here. Judas is coming, he's coming with some soldiers, so let's get out. When he says, rise, let us be going, he's actually saying, let's go and, and meet them. Jesus goes to where they are. How did Judas even know where to find Jesus? John's gospel tells us. John chapter 18, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where they entered a garden. Now Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. If Jesus was trying to avoid Judas, he wouldn't have gone to the place that Judas would have suspected, the place that they often met. He went there because he wanted Judas to be able to find him. He wasn't running from his challenge. He was going towards it. He was facing it. Verse 3, so Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. A detachment is one-tenth of a legion. A, a full legion is 6,000 people. So Judas shows up with 6,000. Hundred Roman soldiers. Why 600 Roman soldiers? That's an awful lot just to take one guy. I wonder if Judas had told them some of the things he had seen and said, you better be careful. This guy can do some amazing supernatural things. If you really want to take him, you better come with a lot of soldiers. Why were they carrying uh, torches and lanterns and weapons? Well, I believe they were carrying the torches and the lanterns because they were expecting Jesus to run and to hide and they would have to find him. And they were carrying the weapons because they thought that perhaps Jesus and his disciples would try to, try to fight them. John 18, 4, Jesus, knowing all that was coming upon him, stepped forward and asked them, whom are you seeking? Instead of running from this challenge, Jesus stepped forward forward to meet it. Verse 4, Jesus asked them, whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. Jesus said, I am he. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Picture that in your mind. All these soldiers here, Jesus standing there and he says, actually he says two words. If you look in your Bible, you see that, that word, he is italicized. So what Jesus said was actually just, I am. In the Old Testament, you remember when Moses encounters God in the burning bush, he says, who shall I tell them sent me? And God answers from the burning bush, tell them I am has sent you. When Jesus says, I am, there is such power to it that all of them fall to the ground in front of him. So he asked them again, whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I told you that I am he, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. While he's being arrested, who is Jesus thinking about? His disciples, his friends, and the authorities let the disciples go. Jesus was in total control. He says, I am, and they all fall to the ground. He says, let them go, and later on, eventually, they do. They let them all go. I want you to see that Jesus faced his challenge. He didn't run from it, and he was in total control control of the situation. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Jesus said, do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he'll provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Remember, a legion is 6,000. 12 legions of angels is 72,000. To put that kind of power in perspective, in the Old Testament, one angel defeated the entire Assyrian army, 185,000 men. I, I'm sure when the disciples looked around, they, they were overwhelmed. They saw all these soldiers. They saw all these weapons. 
But Jesus knew that all of the resources of heaven were available to him. The challenges you face today may seem overwhelming. Family challenges, financial challenges, health challenges, moral challenges. But just like Jesus, all of the resources of heaven are available to you. 1 Corinthians 15 says, My dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Don't avoid your challenges, face them. Number five, you win when your priorities are right. Who did Jesus care about? Well, he cared about people. So let these men go. He cared about his father and his father's will. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He even cared about those that came to oppose him. Later on, we're going to see Malchus gets his ear cut off. And the last miracle Jesus does before he goes to the cross is to heal this man who opposed him. Jesus' priorities were right. What did Judas care about? Well, it, we saw at the beginning of the chapter, Judas goes to the authorities and he says, what will you give me if I hand him over to you? Judas cared about himself and he cared about money. And he's not alone in that. What happened to the people that Jesus cared about? John 18, 9, Jesus said, I haven't lost one of those you gave me. What happened to the money Judas cared about? Well, we'll see it in the next chapter. He lost it all. And not only did he lose the money, he lost something much more important. He lost himself in the process. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, when your priorities are right and you put God and his kingdom first, then everything you need, everything that's best for you, gets added to you. It's a matter of having your priorities right. That's how you win. Verse 48. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi. And kissed him. A kiss is a normal greeting in that culture. My, my brother-in-law Aldo's from Italy. I, I remember I met Aldo when I was probably like 12 years old. My sister brought him home. I, I put out my hand to shake hands with him. And he just gave me a big bear hug and kissed me on the cheek. See, in his culture, that, that was the normal greeting. So the way that you showed friendship to one another. It was the same thing in Jesus' culture. A kiss was the way that a, a student would show respect for a teacher and a friend would show love towards a friend. Judas took a sign of love and friendship and respect and used it to betray Jesus. He could have done this anyway. He didn't have to use a kiss. He could have just pointed him out. He could have said, the one I go up and I stand next to, the one I go up and I talk to. He could have done it anyway but he chose a symbol of love and respect to betray Jesus. Every day our church posts a devotional thought. Uh, back in April, Jim Callahan wrote, Do we betray Christ with a kiss? Do we tell him we love him and at the same time not forgive our brother? Do we ask his forgiveness for giving into temptation while leaving an obvious open door of temptation in our life? Do we raise our hands in worship, overcome with emotion, yet refuse to deal with bitterness, anger, and gossiping? Let's let our love for Christ and our kiss of worship be without betrayal. Let's close and lock the doors of temptation, forgive others as he's forgiven us, and be kind and compassionate to one another. As we take responsibility to confront sin, our kisses of worship will be holy kisses without the shame of betrayal. He went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus' response is absolutely unexpected. 
If it had been you and me, and we knew that Judas was there, and he was there to betray us, what would we have said to him? Maybe something like, you snake, how could you? Jesus' response, Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Jesus knew why he came, yet he still called Judas friend. And he asked him a question. Why have you come? It's not that Jesus didn't know the answer. He wanted Judas to consider this. Why are you doing this? To examine his motives, even to the very end. Jesus is reaching out to, to Judas. Finally, number six, you win when you fight with the right weapons. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. We know from John's gospel that this is Peter. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Peter was fighting the wrong enemy with the wrong weapon. See, the servant of the high priest wasn't the enemy. Years later, Peter would come to realize this. Years later, he wrote, Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Sometimes we fight the wrong enemy too. Unsaved people aren't the enemy. And yet sometimes we treat them like they are. We're harsh and we're mean and we're cruel and we're combative. And sometimes, sometimes we act more like Peter than we do like Jesus. Peter used his sword. Jesus used a different weapon. Luke chapter 22 says, One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Aren't you glad God is able to do this? You know, as I think on my life, I think of some of the, some of the wrong things I've done. Some of the unkind things I've said. And, 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 and you do these things and, and you're immediate, sometimes immediately sorry for them. But you can't take them back, or not fully, can you? You can't go back in time and change it. But isn't it incredible that Jesus can repair the damage? Because sometimes we've done things that have caused damage. Damaged a friendship, a relationship. We've done things that, that we say, uh -uh, I wish there was some way I could undo it, and we can't. But it's the power of Jesus that, that he can repair the damage. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We use God's mighty weapons, not the weapons of the world, to demolish the strongholds. See, we often fight the wrong enemy with the wrong weapons. Joseph Sazan knew that. Joseph Sazan was a pastor in communist Romania. When he was threatened for preaching the gospel, he said this, Sir, let me explain how I see this. Your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. You see how different the Christian's weapons are? Here's how it works. You know that my sermons on tape have spread all over the country. If you kill me, those sermons will be sprinkled with my blood. Everyone will know I died for my preaching. And everyone who has a tape will pick it up and say, I'd better listen again to what this man preached. Because he really meant it. He sealed it with his life. So, sir, my sermons will speak ten times louder than before. I'll actually rejoice in this supreme victory if you kill me. Verse 55. Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple. and You didn't seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. You see, this wasn't a mistake. This was all a part of God's plan. It was fulfilling scripture. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. 
It seemed like a defeat. But Jesus knew the truth. Just a short time earlier, he had said to his disciples, the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you'll be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. Things aren't always the way they look on the surface. Winning isn't a sometime thing, it's an every time thing. Every day. Surrender yourself to God, body, soul, mind, spirit. Give it all into his hands every day. Be gracious to those who fail you. You'll want them to be gracious to you when you fail them. Every day, pray. You'll discover more about God and about his will, and that's a win. Every day, face your challenges. Every day, get your priorities right. And every day, fight the good fight with the right weapons. Jesus willingly gave his life for you. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down voluntarily. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. We come together today to celebrate that amazing truth. If you have your uh, communion cups that we passed out, you can take them at this time. If you have something in your home that you can use to celebrate communion, remember the important thing is that we do this in accordance with what Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Our Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus Christ, without sin, who took all our sin on himself so that we could have forgiveness of sin and be a part of your family. Thank you, Lord, for Christ and for his amazing love. After supper was ended, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins and in our place, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. I pray, Lord, that we understand we always win the victory through you, not through ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for what you did in the Garden of Gethsemane for us. And we thank you, Lord, for your incredible love for us. And we just pray, Lord, that this day and each and every day, that we would live for you, the one who loves us, died for us, and lives for us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.